Prior to 1834, every parish in Britain could decide how to look after its poor. The Poor Law Amendment Act of 1834 changed this. The Act tried to ensure that everyone was looked after in the same way. Every town and village in the country was supposed to send their poor to a workhouse. There were 835 workhouses in Britain. There are now just two that you can visit, and one is here at Gresson Hall, just north of Dereham. Before the Amendment Act, some parishes already had large buildings where the poor were looked after. Here at Gresson Hall, a house of industry was opened in 1777, and those from nearby parishes were accommodated. It converted to a union workhouse in 1836. The workhouses provided care for people who needed help. They were called workhouses because adults had to work to help pay for their keep. It cost a lot of money to look after poor people, and it was hoped that people would only come in if they were desperate, so life was deliberately made tough. There were 22 workhouses in Norfolk in the 1860s, each built and run by a group of 40 to 50 parishes known as a union. Hence they were known as union workhouses, each with an elected guardian to make sure it was run properly. They were located in Acle, Thetford, Kings Lynn, Wicklewood, Aylsham, Erpingham, Downham Market, in fact throughout Norfolk, and in the centre of the county, Gresson Hall, officially known as the Mitford and Launditch Union Workhouse. Since 1978, Norfolk County Council have run these buildings as a successful recreation of a Victorian workhouse, giving visitors a chance to journey through its history as well as that of a traditional farm set in 50 acres of beautiful countryside. Work has just been completed on a major renovation costing around 1.8 million, much of which came from Heritage Lottery funding. Megan Dennis is the curator at Gresson Hall. A couple of years ago, Chris, we were lucky enough to be involved in a project with the National Archives based at Kew in London, and we got the opportunity to look at the real records from this building, which was really eye-opening. And basically, we wanted to share some of those amazing stories with our visitors. We've put the people back into the workhouse, if you like. It wasn't all Oliver Twist. There's lots of sad stories, but there's also the positive stories as well. It's the children who went on to become artists or shoemakers, despite the really bad start they had in life at the workhouse. I hope school children who come through and have a look at the new displays think a bit about how we deal with poverty today. You know, where you'd go today if you have no food, what you can do for shelter, they're the same issues, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, our communities were facing the same issues. This wonderful renovation led by Megan and her team really has opened up the history of these buildings. It's a hugely successful use of their heritage lottery funding. On average, there are two Norfolk schools here each weekday during term time. It's an opportunity for the children to learn so much more about life in the workhouse. The workhouses that were created after the 1834 Poor Law Amendment Act established the precedence that every town and village in the country should look after their poor in the same way. Poor people in the workhouse were called inmates. New inmates on arrival came here to the receiving ward where they were bathed and issued with standard uniforms. They had to hand in all of their own personal possessions and clothing which were returned to them when they left. But when you entered the workhouse, you stopped being an individual, you became one of the poor. The uniforms were plain and simple, made from cheap cloth, yet hard wearing. They had to be returned before inmates left. Some tried to take their uniforms when they left. After all, they were probably better than the clothes they brought into the workhouse. When you entered, you were put into one of seven groups or classes. Men and boys over the age of 15 who could work, similar to women and girls. Men and women unable to work. Boys and girls aged 7 to 15. And finally, children less than 7 years old. Each had separate day rooms and yards to work and rest in, separate dormitories and the different groups were not allowed to see or talk to each other.
everyday life in the workhouse was a strict routine. Everybody woke, ate their meals, worked and went to bed at set times. And here in the exhibit, in this new part, you've got very much a hands-on discovery area. So, what time did you get up in the morning? 5.45, all the able-bodied inmates woke at 5.45 every day, including Sundays. And what time did you start work? Well, that was 7 a.m. And that was 10 hours a day in the summer. But what about for the children? Well, when did you get up, it says here. You can have a look. Again, 5.45. Off they go to school or work every day from 7 o'clock. And what time did you come home from school, children? 6 p.m. That's 11-hour days. Hmm. And what time do you go to bed? 8 o'clock. All inmates, children and adults, had to go to bed at 8 o'clock every single night. And for the children, when is your bath time? Mm -hmm. Well, workhouse children had to take regular supervised baths. All had to share the same dirty water. That is one way of making sure the children get into that bath very quickly. Workhouse food was boring. The diet was designed to give inmates just enough to survive. Rachel Duffield is the learning and engagement officer here and has worked on the new refurbishments. A typical menu on a typical day would be three meals, which might be more than they get at home, but your breakfast would be a pint and a half of delicious gruel, and then your lunch would be probably the main meal of the day, so you might get soup or meat if you're lucky, only once a week. The rest of the time, all the other meals would be bread and cheese. On special occasions, such as uh, Queen Victoria's coronation, they got beef and plum pudding and beer. And uh, for Queen Victoria's wedding, they got ale and buns, but those were special treats. And at Christmas time, uh, the meal stayed more or less the same, but the master used to serve it to them as an act of uh, friendliness at Christmas. Life in the workhouse could be better than being on the outside. It was certainly more predictable. You got your three meals a day, you had a bed to sleep in, you had clean clothes, you got a bath once a week, and none of those things were guaranteed if you were a poor person living in a remote rural village. So that was the choice people made when they came into the workhouse. They had to swap their freedom for their survival. The way we treat the poor and vulnerable in our 21st century society says a lot about us. But is there a perfect solution for looking after the poor? The workhouse created the idea of a national system of care, which led to the creation of the NHS, the welfare state, the benefit system. Future generations will judge us in the same way that we judge the workhouse today. The workhouse here at Gresson Hall is one of just two in the UK that we can visit and learn about the past. Life was dull and restrictive. It was designed to put off people who could work but who didn't want to. And the Victorians believed that children, the sick and infirm, deserved help, but others did not. Children often ended up in the workhouse because they had no families to look after them. In many ways, they had a better childhood than those who lived outside the workhouse. They went to school, they were taught a trade. But outside the workhouse, children did not have to go to school until 1881, so consequently, children as young as four or five worked. The guardians that ran the workhouse wanted to make sure that the children in their care were looked after. They wanted to train them for a job, so that when they became adults, they did not need to rely on the system. There are not many changes to the original schoolroom, and Rachel Duffield, the learning officer here at Gresson Hall, has agreed to show me around. And this is one of the original school uh, buildings? Yes, it is. This was the girls' schoolroom. Uh, the boys were taught in the main building. Right. And immediately that I come in here, I can see a desk that looks exactly like the one I used to sit at when I was at school. I can't believe it. It's just... It, I bet I can't even fit into it anymore. I just... <laughs> it is just how it was when we were at school. We had one of those and 
You had your inkwell there and put your pens and pencils there. This is just, this is just like the one I used to was taught at. It's amazing. So um, what, was a, what was a typical school day like then? A typical school day began at 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. and then they would spend at least three hours on their three R's. So that's reading, writing and arithmetic, of course. And not forgetting Bible studies. The scriptures were an important part of their education. Uh, then in the afternoons they would do what we would call vocational training, so something that would enable them to get a job when they left the workhouse so they would no longer be a burden to the ratepayers. Yeah. Uh, so boys would um, do something like farming skills, labouring, blacksmithing, cobbling, all sorts of different things, and girls would be most likely to end up going into service, yeah. so they would be taught skills appropriate to that, so um, housekeeping and that sort of thing. Tell me, Rachel, about some of the punishments that were meted out if Pupils right, so if people fidgeted, mm -hmm. we have the finger stocks. So that stops you um, fiddling with things you shouldn't be fiddling with. Right. And um, if you didn't sit up straight, we have something to assist you. So this is the back straight. Now that went round, whoops, behind you like that. There you go. So you couldn't oh, slouch. Right. Yeah. Oh, right. And if you were really naughty? Really naughty. Christopher, six of the best. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, well, I happily can say I never ever got six of the best. I even got one of the best, but um, I did occasionally get the sort of the look from the teacher mm, that definitely. clearly I was the school dunce. So if you were the school dunce. Well, I have just the thing for you in that right. case. Oh. <laughs> Our dunce's cap. Lovely, thanks. Thanks, Rachel. This is a lovely memory of my visit to the Gresson Hall Village School. Thank you. You're very welcome. With almost 400 inmates at its peak, you can imagine that the daily laundry at Gresson Hall was immense. And subsequently, it needed a large laundry to do the washing. It washed all the dirty bedding and clothing from the infirmary too, which included the soil and stained sheets, which had to be washed several times before they were clean. It was all completed by hand until 1901, when a steam-powered system was installed. The steam boiler and the engine turning the shaft that drove the belts that ran the length of the laundry building. Oh, wow. Right. Gosh. And you've even got the noise of the machines going. It just yeah. recreates that whole atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. So I guess these big machines were the sheets, all the yes, soil sheets? Yes, this is the sheets from the hospital and from the inmates' beds. Right. And they could be washed at all different temperatures. We've got uh, blue for a cold rinse and red for a hot boil oh, wash. So that so was on. your temperature gauge? Yep, yep. Right, right, I see. Yeah. And then the smaller uh, yeah, machine the, there? Yeah, the small machine was for pillowcases and aprons and small things like that. Also, matron tended to uh, wash her clothes separately from the inmates' things in the smaller washing oh, right. machine. And I imagine the smell in here must have been really something quite extraordinary. Yes, well, come with me. So, here your nose can transport you back in time to the right. wash house. Right. Uh, this was a noisy, steamy, smelly, stinky place. I imagine. And we've got some examples of the smells you might encounter yeah. just here. So, we've got stale, soiled, sick, or sweaty. Which one is it to be? I don't think I'm going to go near sick. I'll okay. try, let me just try stale. Oh! <laughs> oh, oh. oh, that was awful. Soiled, I, I think I'd, I'd just give that one a miss as well. What's sweaty like? Oh. Oh, 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 oh! Rachel, tell me, who used to do all of the washing and the ironing and the laundry? Well, it was the women that were here. The female inmates did all the work that kept the place going. In fact, mm. the work was so hard that they got four extra pints of beer a week. <laughs> 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 well, I wonder who does all the washing and the ironing in your house. Is there a difference between the work that the men and the women do? And more importantly, who does drink those extra four pints of beer a week? <laughs> Rachel, thank you very much for hosting very us. Welcome. That's it from us here at Gresson Hall for today. It's been a fascinating visit and I hope you're going to have a chance to come and see it soon. The workhouse at Gresson Hall is just one of the 835 that was spread across the UK, but it is one of only two that have been converted into a museum. However, here at Gresson Hall there's much more that can be seen away from the workhouse buildings. Cherry Tree Cottage, set in these delightful gardens, was available only for elderly married couples that were living there. There are recreations of some of the shops, the post office, the village store, the seed merchants and the blacksmiths. And there's an adventure playground in the woodlands for those youngsters wishing to let off some steam, a kitchen garden and the traditional orchard.
Many of you that have visited Gresson Hall before will be familiar with the farm, I'm sure. These are the rather rare East Anglian Norfolk horn sheep. There's red pole cattle, large black pigs, and of course, Suffolk punches that usually work the land. There's so much more here, including a very educational barn, St Nicholas's barn. <laughs> The farm at Gresson Hall served the workhouse for over 70 years with the production of milk, butter, cheese and so forth. But it's continued to be a working farm. And here we can see the story of a traditional crop farm, the preparation, the growing, the sowing, the harvesting and so forth. It gives all of us an opportunity to visit Gresson Hall to look at this labour intensive work that basically involved the whole community. This was one of the first combine harvesters in Norfolk, used by farmer Roland Shearer at Burnham Hall Farm in Burnham Market. He was influential in bringing combine harvesters to Norfolk and was very passionate about this type of machinery. Combine harvesters were developed in America and of course made harvesting large fields much easier. It combined three different processes and machines, the threshing, the reaping and the binding. The combine harvester, of course, meant less work for farm labourers and meant harvesting much cheaper and quicker. And of course, the quicker the harvest could be gathered in, the less risk of rain damaging the crops. Most of the items in this exhibit do in fact come from farms from around Norfolk and you can see that from all of the signage that's on. But one that comes from just outside is this and one of my favourites, A. Edwards and Sons of Woosbeach. This is their gooseberry blower. Mm. So I'm imagining the gooseberries get put into here. There's a large handle which turns the drum round. It blows off the stalks and the leaves and out come pristine gooseberries ready for the tart and the custard and the crumble. <laughs> The Gooseberry Blower, a fine piece of British innovation. Clearly there's something for everyone in the family when you come to visit Gresson Hall, whether your interest is the Victorian workhouse, this working farm, or indeed the 50 acres that you can walk along by the river and enjoy the Norfolk countryside. This recent refurbishment has given us all an opportunity to enjoy the rural life of Norfolk.